2002 Yu-Gi-Oh! was a much simpler time, filled with big attack monsters and not much strategy. But what happens when you add in a couple new sets and some cards that rip your opponent's hand to shreds? Well, you end up with a format where hand control is the best deck and the writing on the wall being shown before 2004 that something bad was coming to the TCG. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Avery. Thank you so much for over 900 subscribers. And this is a 2003 hand control format retrospective. So many choices, but only one way to win. Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! All new today at 1110 Central and Pacific on Kids WB. So let's go back all the way to August of 2003. 18 players from all around the world traveled to New York City to compete in the first ever world championship for Yu-Gi-Oh! Out of those 18 players, there was one dominant deck strategy which would be the first proven meta deck in the TCG's history. That being hand control. Now, as I discussed in my video on Beatdown, Yu-Gi-Oh! in its early months lacked a lot of the complexity of cards and strategies that it would gain later on. However, as the game passed its one-year mark outside of Japan, the move towards a higher level of play started to occur. This was due to a combination of the TCG's card pool rapid expansion and increasing accessibility of power cards to a portion of players than was possible in the earlier game. Now, the result of this advancement in the player base's overall skill Skill was a rise in the focus on combos and card advantage over pure damage as a deck's goal. Beyond this increase in more complex strategies, hand control is particularly notable for being the dominant deck at the first ever large sanctioned event in the TCG. Before the 2003 World Championship, the largest tournaments were those held at local game shops. Because of this, the overall level of skill that a player could find at any given tournament was largely limited by their local player pool. By there being a tournament with as high of a skill level and as large at least for the numerous side events as the World Championship, hand control truly got to shine as the superior deck of 2003. The immense power of hand control lay in its ability to demolish an opponent's card advantage through a variety of different cards focused on forcing the opponent to discard. However, because of the immensely swingy nature of the game at this time, caused by all the extremely powerful cards that existed such as Monster Reborn, Rageki, and Fiber Jar, destroying an opponent's hand was oftentimes not enough to guarantee victory on its own. Own. That's where one single card comes in, Yada Garasu. Now, Yada Garasu was released in the sixth TCG booster set, Legacy of Darkness. In the summer of 2003, with its release, players soon realized the immense potential of the combo that it enabled, the infamous Yada Lock. Now, this lock involved being able to attack directly with Yada Garasu while your opponent had no cards in hand, preventing them from ever drawing again, as Yada Garasu could simply be resummoned every turn because it was a spirit monster. While this lock was a guaranteed win for the player performing it, it was not something that was easy to do without a dedicated strategy for destroying the opponent's hand. Remember, this is 2003. We didn't get Tier 0 Chaos Emperor Dragon Chaos Control until 2004. We also have a retrospective of that on the channel as well. The first set of cards used to destroy opponent's hand were a trio of spell cards from the 2002 set Magic Ruler, later changed to Spell Ruler, Delinquent Duo, Forceful Century, and Confiscation. Forceful Century and Delinquent Duo saw extremely widespread play in almost all decks. However, Confiscation was less common outside of hand control decks at the time. To supplement these three cards, most hand control players also ran at least one Magician of Faith, allowing the player to maintain the pressure on their opponent's hand. The other main cards used to deplete an opponent's hand were two monsters released in the July 2003 booster set, Pharaonic Guardian, Don Zalug, and Spirit Reaper. Both of these monsters discarded a card from the opponent's hand when they inflicted battle damage, but they also held additional utility beyond that. Don Zalug had an alternate effect that allowed it to choose between discarding a card and sending the top card of an opponent's deck to the graveyard, making it so that Don Zalug kept his usefulness even after an opponent's hand had already been depleted. Spirit Reaper, on the other hand, had the extremely powerful effect of being unable to be destroyed by battle. This made Spirit Reaper tough for a lot of more simplistic beatdown decks that relied heavily on destruction by battle. White Magical Hat also saw some use in the local level and in side decks, although he had been power creep by Don Zalug by the time that hand control truly gained popularity. He mainly saw usage at the local level because card accessibility was still difficult for many players, making the ultra-rare Don Zalug 
not as attainable in large quantities like White Magical Hat was. Remember, again, this is 2003. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have TCG Player. We didn't have any of these things. The final card hand control employed to maintain card advantage was Drop Off. Drop Off is interesting in that it didn't see usage in all hand control decks, but many of the higher ranking decks at Worlds used multiple Drop Off in their main deck, while many others used them in their side deck. Drop Off had use in that it could replicate the effect of Yada on a similar scale, allowing for a more consistent lockdown of the opponent's hand. While almost all decks ran Sangin and Witch of the Black Forest along with Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity, Hand Control was one of the first decks to truly capitalize on the concept of floaters. Floaters refer to monsters that, when destroyed, summon or quote-unquote float into a replacement monster. The main floater used in Hand Control was Mystic Tomato, a monster that synergized very well with the two main hand control monsters, Dun, Zalug, and Spear Reaper. By having a monster that can maintain field advantage and also more consistent get out some of the next key tools, hand control more consistently was able to make plays it wanted to when it wanted to. This was something that happened far less with decks like Beatdown, which relied entirely on drawing into the right monsters and power cards when they were needed largely through random chance. Many hand control decks also took to putting two or three Mystical Space Typhoon in their main deck, something that was not common before this point. The main advantage of this was largely to synergize with Mirage of Nightmare, an extremely powerful spell from Pharaonic Guardian. MST also had the additional use of being able to fight back against all the extremely powerful traps that existed at the time, such as Torrential Tribute and Ring of Destruction. The combination of these various different consistency boosting strategies definitely played a major role in why Hand Control was the first deck to truly shine through larger events where a deck performance over numerous rounds became much more important than at a three or four round local tournament. Because Hand Control is a deck with verified results from a high level event, unlike Beatdown, we can look at some example deck lists from the 2003 World Championship. The first deck that I want to look at is, and I apologize if I pronounce this wrong because I'm sure I will, is Ning Lu Lung's first place World Championship deck. In his build, we can see many of the options I talked about before, such as Mystic Tomato, Don Zalug, and Drop Off. While his main deck choices were not excessively unique, what set his deck apart from many other builds at the time was how many cards he ran at three copies. While it is very common to see players running as many copies of their best card as possible in the modern game, running three copies of a card in 2003 was not usually seen. Running three copies of many of his most important combo cards allowed him to more consistently draw into cards he needed to win. Something else to look at is the contents of his side deck. While almost all competitive players today are very familiar with the concept of the side deck, this was far less common back in the early days of the game. However, we can see that Lee Young focused his side deck on three main cards, Torrential Tribute, Book of Moon, and Electric Snake. While Torrential Tribute seems apparent as a card to wipe the board and prevent beatdown decks from gaining field advantage, Book of Moon was more of a response to the increase in powerful effect monsters like Don Zalug that could be prevented from using their effects with Book of Moon. Book of Moon also allowed for the abuse of Magician of Faith without having to run more copies. Finally, the inclusion of Electric Snake is something that is a direct response to other hand control decks by being a card that allows a player to gain card advantage instead of losing it when their hand is being attacked by the opponent. He also ran cards like Exile Force and Scapegoat for their potency against beatdown decks that focused on swarming the field with numerous high attack power monsters. While there isn't any information on the effectiveness of Lee Young's side deck, from an outside view, they all seem to be relevant responses to the meta of beatdown and hand control that he faced at the time. The other deck we're going to look at is that of Mike Rosenberg, the third place player at the 2003 World Championship and one of only three players from the United States that reached the top eight. Immediately off the bat, you will notice some of the similar basic choices in the deck, such as Spirit Reaper for discarding in monster form, Mirage of Nightmare, and Drop Off. However, Rosenberg's deck is interesting for its lack of Mystic Tomato, dropping overall consistency. He did utilize Nimble Momonga, however, as a floater, but only to maintain field presence and not to search out his key combo pieces. He also ran Guardian Sphinx, a card which definitely saw use more on the local level, but was still a powerful card in the 2003 format due to its ability to provide 
provide massive non-destruction removal. However, its effect did go somewhat against the idea of trying to constantly pull off the Yada Lock by keeping the opponent's hand full of their own monsters. As far as a side deck is concerned, the decks that is meant to address are noticeably different from the ones that Lee Young's side deck was seemingly designed to counter. While Lee Young's side deck seemed primarily focused on defeating Beatdown and other hand control decks, Rosenberg's sideboard focuses more on additional hand control cards as well as a variety of cards designed to counter Burn and Exodia decks. While these decks saw a decent amount of play on the local level in 2003, they were far too inconsistent in their ability to win and did not see much usage at the World Championship. One last card of note in Rosenberg's side deck is Trap Dust Shoot. While this card became widely used in future formats, it was very underused in the early months that it was out despite serving as a very powerful additional hand depletion card. Its lack of widespread use at this time can likely be attributed to the wide array of other discard outlets, making the minimum hand limit difficult to reach consistently, as well as large number of monsters not being as common in hand control decks as they were in beatdown decks. However, it was definitely an interesting choice for a side deck card, especially against beatdown decks that ran a lot of monsters, as it could remove powerful monsters from a player's hand without letting the card go to the graveyard where it could possibly be revived by something like Monster Reborn. While Hand Control was the first truly meta deck and stood on top of the Yu-Gi-Oh! world for the second half of 03, it would soon be surpassed by the next major meta deck type, Chaos. Chaos decks utilize a lot of similar strategies to hand control, however, they had to run light monsters in addition to dark monsters, making Mystic Tomato less viable as a searcher for all the deck's important combo pieces. Chaos also had many more explosive and powerful plays at its disposal, leaving hand control in the dust. And if you want to see that Chaos retrospective, you can check that out on the channel as well. Going into future eras of the game, Hand Control was officially put to rest by the banning of various pieces of the original Hand Control spell trio, as well as the banning of Yada, killing the Yada Lock. However, Yada Garasu and Time Sealer are both at 1 currently, hopefully will be at 3 soon, in the TCG. With these combo pieces dead and with the increasing prevalence of the graveyard as an extended resource for many decks, the viability of decks focused entirely on discarding the opponent's hand became less and less viable. As such, it is no longer playable in the modern game. Although many powerful modern deck strategies have focused on depleting an opponent's hand to gain advantage. I'm looking at you, wind-ups, looping people for five and potentially six cards in their hand, proving that the ideas behind hand control never truly died. I hope that you enjoyed this retrospective. It was definitely interesting seeing that there were deck lists at the time of 2003 and the cards that were played and it really goes to show how much Yu-Gi-Oh! has evolved. Whether you think that's for better or for worse, it is definitely a trip to see how the game has evolved and continues to this day in 2022 to evolve. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Thank you again so much for over 900 subscribers. I know we are going to get to 1,000 eventually. Thank you again so much for your support, and I will see you in the next video.